I did. All right. Uh, welcome. Uh, today is what day is it? It's uh, June or no, May second, five thirty p.m. We're here in the vets hall for the uh, monthly meeting of the Harbor Advisory Board. Uh, with that, we would like to establish a quorum, a call to order. I'll do a uh, voice roll call. Start out over there. Uh, Member Witowski. Present. Member Green. Here. Member Vale. Here. Member Dowdy. Here. Member O'Brien. Here. Member Hanson. Here. And uh, Chairman Myers is also here. <laughs> Feels weird. Um, with that, we'll uh, next on the agenda, we'll do a moment of silence. Thank you. All right, and next up is the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Where's the flag? There's the flag. Right, I guess I'll start since I didn't volunteer. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's get nervous about that one. All right, uh, next on the agenda is we will do the uh, board members' uh, uh, liaison announcements and public outreach. So I'll start with Gene, nothing? No. No? Sorry, Gloria. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, disappointed we're not hearing about the fishing stuff, but that's okay. Uh, next up is uh, Jeremiah. Uh, yeah, I don't have a whole lot uh, to report. The uh, uh, the uh, crab fishing was cut short this year uh, because of the presence of whales, which are almost always present. But uh, also, the commercial fishermen's organization's lawsuit is uh, still moving along. Last week, it was uh, it cleared the next stage, so we are ready to move on with it. There's nothing really to report on it but uh, that's about it all right thank you member hansen i don't have anything for this meeting i know all right that i'll run over to uh member vale well winter uh, appears to be behind us which is good um the morro bay maritime museum is paint everywhere um, we've got three vessels undergoing restoration and uh, then we'll move on to another two it's uh, still safe and fun to go there. We have new hats, and uh, that's about it from that side. Thank you. Member Green. Um, Cuesta graduation is in about uh, two weeks, and uh, Capola graduation is the June 15th weekend, so there'll be uh, increased traffic um, from, from guests coming to yeah, see graduation, uh, which is uh, good for businesses. Um, there is... Um, a planning commission meeting on Tuesday uh, where they're inviting the public um, to uh, continue commenting on the environmental impact report on the BESS uh, battery project. Um, it, I believe it's the only agenda item on, at the planning commission this coming Tuesday. Um, so uh, the floor is the public's to uh, add anything that they want or inquire about anything regarding the battery uh, project uh, here in Morbay. Thank you, Member Witowski. Yeah, I was going to shout out the Marine Swap Meet, um, but I will be there eating smoked oysters and trying to find used wetsuits for kids. Always a good thing for that. Um, but I also wanted to shout out the Morro Bay Rotary has another tri-tip dinner um, planned for June 5th. It's always delicious and great to support the Rotary. All right. Uh, yeah, my... Uh... Outreach was somewhat limited, but it'll actually come up as a future agenda item. Uh, some of the liver boards uh, approached me over the last few weeks, prompted by the skiffs, but that's not really the the, the, the outreach piece. Was there, I guess at one point there was a uh, liver board like association that somehow had met with the harbor department or the HAB. Um, it was disbanded some time ago, um, but it may be worth revisiting. So probably maybe talk about it as a future ed agenda item or at a later date directly with the harbor director. That's all I've got for um, outreach. Any 
Any last comments? Nope. Uh, let's see. Oh, we don't have any presentations, unfortunately, this time. Uh, but next up is public comment. Uh, for anybody that can't stay for the uh, meeting and has a comment or anything that's not on the agenda, uh, I have three minutes if anybody wants to step forward. Um, members and chair, thank you. Thanks, Mary, for the shout out. I will also shout out, my name is Bill LaFay, and I'm um, part of the Friends of the Morro Bay Harbor Department. And we are holding our Marine Swap Meet on June 29th, 2024. Uh, it's on our website if you'd like to sell. the. Um, it's only $25 to get a 10 by 10 booth, and it is free to attend. We'll have surfboards, marine supplies. It's a great event, and um, it's well attended. So look on our website and um, look for the – we have signs and stuff like that. So uh, come on out and enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, anybody else like to come up? Thank you, board. Uh, my name is Drew Jacobson. I have a question. Uh, I have a presentation on the uh, liveaboard and uh, issues, but I understand that it is on the agenda later on. So should I speak about it now the, or the liveaboards are not on the agenda item we the comment i made earlier was putting it on a future agenda um it's the the harbor the, storage oh the moorings or yeah the... harbor storage uh harbor skiff storage program um i don't believe that's on the agenda we are going to talk about the mooring field uh, okay but, then I'll, uh, I'll make my presentation now okay my name is drew jacobson i have a prepared statement that i wish to read and thank you again for the opportunity. I'm a boat mooring owner. I'm here this evening to speak about the recent adoption and enforcement of the Harbor Skiff Storage Program. Over the last week, I have been in contact with the Harbor Department in hopes of understanding some of the new program requirements and the negative outcomes they pose. First, skiffs are a vital means of conveyance between shore and boat. If you are prevented from using a skiff, you lose all accessibility to your boat and mooring. Several of us have reached out to the Harbor Department. However, some issues remain unresolved and unanswered. The primary question I have with the skiff docking permit program, and there are several, is this. And this is the first scenario. As a private owner of a mooring who has a, a transient boat on that mooring, and the transient boat leaves, the skiff docking permit for that mooring is immediately terminated. And let's say the Harbor Department has run out of available skiff permits, a possibility that the Harbor Skiff Program outlines under Policy E of the skiff permit program. The mooring owner may be placed on some wait list, and that mooring will stay empty with no way of accessing the mooring until the skiff docking permit becomes available sometime in the future, perhaps months or even years. Let me give you another scenario. I plan on buying and mooring on my mooring a small fishing boat, perhaps in next June or July, but the harbor department doesn't have but the harbor department doesn't have an available skiff permit. Again, I'm placed on some wait list for months or years. To me, that is completely unreasonable and unnecessary. Again, skiffs are a vital means of conveyance between shore and boat. If you are prevented from using a skiff, you will lose all accountability to your boat and mooring. We are hoping that uh, we are hoping that one of you will act as a facilitator between mooring owners and the harbor department. Is that it? I'm I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Department in it in an across the table sit down discussion that will help us understand why the harbor department is restricting mooring owners from having access to the mooring. Since the mooring owners already pay a monthly mooring fee to the harbor department, adding an extra eight or nine dollars a month is reasonable. Please permanently link skiff permits to each mooring number and not to the individual skiffs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else in the audience would like to speak?
Hi, my name is Denise Jacobs, and I also own a mooring, same one that he does. Um, I have this, basically the same issues. There, why that you're trying to stop some of us to get to our mooring, I'm not sure. They are now going through inspection policies, inspection issues. Um, if you read the policies, there's threats that if you owe money, if you've had issues in the past, which, whatever that might mean, you won't get a permit. You can't get to your boat. Um, I have a hard time signing the papers that we're supposed to sign. I don't believe this is a real policy. I've never seen a subjective policy that has threats in it that we might do this, we might do that. There's 75 mooring, 75 permits, but maybe we'll add some permits. Maybe we'll take some permits away. It's first come, first serve. I am so confused. I've talked to the Harbor Department. We've had, every time you talk to them, you get a different answer. You know, so I think... I would just like to see it solved before we all sign off on this paperwork that we're now going to be held to follow the rules or not even get to our boat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any more uh, comments from the audience? Come on up. Sorry, I'm a little new to this. Uh, did I hit the green button? All right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Adam Battenberg. I'm also a mooring holder. Um, my concerns are just a little bit different. I want to echo Drew and Denise that I mainly just want um, an agreement that we can sign that can't just be retracted at any time. So I'm fine with if there are violations of the rule, we're kicked out, whatever else from having a skiff. Um, but I don't think it makes sense that the rules can change at any point to remove a skiff. Then I want to present one more scenario. Um, we hope to cruise long term. Currently, you have to be there in person every year. If you're cruising, how can you maintain your skiff? Um, it's just sort of a difficult thing. There's a few other concerns, but mainly the policy makes sense. I'm actually a fan of it uh, as far as trying to uh, make skiffs that are like not just a ton of water and falling and no spots. So I'm for the movement. I just hope we can clarify a few terms. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, any more uh, public comments in the audience? Yes, my name is Joel Solano. I own a mooring here in the harbor. I also own a boat. I'm a liveaboard. We keep our skiff at the Tidelands Dock. I don't see any reason at all for a new program. What I do see a reason is to enforce the program that's there. We we're supposed to have our, our mooring number on our skiff in a readable location. There are more, there are skiffs on the Tidelands dock that are sinking that, that were just recently, just today, this afternoon, one was hauled away from the dock, didn't have a number on it, had been sinking, had Harbor Department uh, life vests laying in the floor of it, that it never returned its way back. If the Harbor Department would just enforce the rule that it already has, there's zero need for any further rule. On the weekends, especially with summer coming up, there's consistently tourists who will leave or weekenders who will leave their kayaks there. There are people who will leave their rowboats there. They're, they have no numbers on them. They're there for a weekend and are gone. If this what this dock is supposed to be, then fine. Let it be a dock for everybody that, that wants to tie a boat up, tie a boat up there. If the dock is supposed to be for the mooring holders, enforce the rules that are there. There's no, there, there's absolutely zero need for another rule that's just going to possibly make up some little bit of a budget shortfall with the uh, addition of a hundred bucks per mooring that are seventy for seventy five permits. It's only seven thousand five hundred dollars. I think my math isn't the best, but it's such a minimal amount. The dock there, they're asking us to accept the dock in the condition it is. It's fine in the condition it is when it's free. It's not fine in the condition that it is if we're having to pay for it. There's holes that fishermen drill in the dock so they can keep their fishing poles in it. I have to be very careful, especially at night. I walk on a stick. I don't want to fall in the hole. Uh, there's... Uh, uh, loose loose planks on the dock. There's screws that are lifting out of the dock. Let's repair the dock. 
And then let's talk about enforcing the rules that are already on the books before we even bring up new rules. The, I don't see them as anything other than a money grab. Thank you, and you have a nice day. All right. Thank you, sir. Anybody else from the audience? Hello, my name is Anastasia Retschow. I am a liveaboard in Mora Bay for about nine to 10 years now. I would like to echo concerns about this SCIF permitting process and the ways that it may unfairly put pressure onto people who do pay their fees monthly. And that is not only mooring holders, but an additional liveaboard permit fee that I believe does include dock use. Um, additionally, I would like to bring up concerns about some of the public resources, specifically at Tideland's dock. A few years ago, there was a second water spigot for boats to fill up their tanks, and it was vandalized. Uh, in present, I believe about two years, it was not fixed, it was capped. Uh, so there's a few things that we are hoping, like Joel had said, where the dock is not in a condition that's very um, user-friendly for not only liveaboards, but the public that comes and uses it. Additionally, there was trash cans available for especially fishermen's waste that hurts life, uh, wildlife and species that was removed and it has not been replaced as well. So I would like to bring up those concerns, especially ahead of summertime when we get such an influx of people who use these resources. Thank you. All right, thank you. A few more comments? All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Corinne Alpers. I'm also a mooring owner and a current liveaboard. Um, I wanted to make some specific suggestions about the SCIF storage agreement just for uh, to provide more clarity for all of us to answer many of the complaints that we've heard. Um, firstly, the SCIF storage agreement starts out in the first paragraph saying, this agreement is terminable or modifiable by the Harbor Department by 30 days written to the store. Um, no refund will be paid to the store. Uh, my concerns with this is if we sign this agreement, we are allowing the Harbor Department to terminate or change the contract we've agreed upon that we've already signed for any reason. I would suggest adding if any of the agreement has been violated, then it can be terminated. I don't want to leave it. I wouldn't personally want to sign uh, an agreement or any kind of legal agreement that would say at any time this can be removed and therefore you cannot get to property that you own. Um, secondly, uh, much as Drew said, there is under the section display of SCIF storage sticker, um, section B, it says store acknowledges this agreement and the SCIF storage sticker are non-transferable or assignable. Um, my concerns with this, especially when paired with the policy rule, if all designated SCIF storage locations are full, then a waiting list will be established. We cannot cruise or sail long term without risking our ability to use our SCIF when we return. Uh, if we rent out the mooring while sailing, the tenant will need to be added to the waiting list, possibly prohibiting them from reaching their vessel. And when we return from our travels, um, we then need to re-register and be added to the waiting list, not preventing us from reaching our property. So what I would suggest, as Drew had mentioned, is finding a way that we can actually assign a permit to the mooring number itself um, so that it can be transferred. It can still be the one skiff per mooring. I am. I think there should be a way that we can get around this. That way we can still make use of our property or make use of our investment. Um, lastly, the comment that Adam mentioned, I agree with the registration. This is under procedures. The registration to use the SCIF storage location shall be in person at the Harbor office. I understand probably the goal here is so that people can't be gone for five years and their whole SCIF fills up with water. That makes sense. There were already some rules though mentioning it needs to have dewatering. So I think that I would suggest that phrase be changed or at least allow for a mail-in to pay the fees just because this is a sailing community. A lot of people hopefully have goals, not everybody, but if you have a sailboat, you'd want to go sail the world. You're not going to come back just to pay this $100 fee. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else in the audience uh, would like to do public comment? Honorable board, my name is Jeff O'Dell. I'm a 54-year resident, a former city council member, and for two and a half years, I sat on this board when its official title was the Morro Bay Harbor Commission, 
and we exercised public oversight and quasi-judicial power over public trust lands and lease sites. Uh, that being said, I'd like to point something out. I was informed about this issue. I'm not, I have not seen the rules or anything about that, but it does seem to be focusing on um, dinghies and, and you know auxiliary craft that do service vessels. Um, I just went down to Bayshore Park, which I'm sure you all know where it is, which has always served as an informal boat storage area. Uh, I went down there today to, to verify how it was, and the city did get rid of a lot of the derelict vessels and does require identification on the boats, but it's my understanding that there is no fees charged. And uh, there are informal uh, boat racks constructed down there. There are, uh, I have pictures if anybody wants to see them, I'm sure you're familiar with it. There's just a hodgepodge of vessels. I conservatively would say there's 50 kayaks just strewn everywhere. Some have a really good layer of guano on them, so they haven't been used in a long time. And I think that the city, first of all, or you, this board might acknowledge the fact that because that is more a Bay City property, we are liable for that situation. And if somebody gets crushed by one of those informal structures or has a trip and fall or gets injured in any way, all they need to do is find an attorney who can spout the magic word negligence, and we're all on the hook for it. I would think that maybe you might consider, if, if it's revenue that you're looking at, maybe coming up with a fee, a fee system for that area instead of having it be free parking for those people and charging the people with a very legitimate daily use of their vessels uh, money to, to be able to store their boat on, on public lands. And I, that's all I had to say. And I didn't, had not thought about even coming to this meeting until I was informed of that. And I just, it's always irked me that we have free parking for some people and some people get to pay a whole lot of money for the very same privilege. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other public comment in the audience? Hey guys, my name is Nancy Cooper. I'm a mooring owner. And when we purchased our mooring, we were told that we could have one dinghy for each licensed adult with our liveaboard permit. Well, there's two licensed adults in my house on my boat. What they, they they're allotting a certain amount of, of um permits. How, what if I want to go to, need to go to work and my husband needs to stay home or he needs to go, we need two different, two different, you know, vehicles. What happens? What, what happens if one day somebody get someone, one of those arbitrator, we can cancel your permit at any time we choose. That that's not right. That is not right. I'm sorry. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Anybody else in the audience would like to uh, do public comment? All right. Thank you. AGP, uh, uh, is there anybody uh, with their hand up in the queue? There are currently no raised hands in the queue. Thank you. Um, with that, um, quite a bit of passion around the SCIF program. I don't know if you'd want to try to address any of the questions about the permit and the process, uh, Harbor Director Schiavone. Chair, sure. <laughs> um, actually, I took down nine different topics, which I think are excellent points. Becca has been reviewing a lot of the requests and some of the um, changes that are being made. I can comment on a few of them. I think others need to be readdressed with Becca to see how, how they might work. But first, let me, I'll just address the agreement itself. That's, you know, vetted by the city attorney. So any change to the agreement is going to require the city attorney's approval. Um, it's my understanding um, that the way Becca has designed this is that the mooring owner is in charge of the permit. So there has been discussions about, well, what do you do if my renter's there and the renter leaves with the permit? That permit, it's up to the owner to let the harbor know, and that permit becomes invalidated, and then a new one is issued to the 
whether it's the next renter or whether it's back to the owner. So I think that issue is, is being addressed. Um, absolutely agree with maintenance. Those are those are some issues. Do want to talk about the um, other areas in the harbor that are being currently used for storage. Um, those are going to be addressed, so we haven't forgotten about those areas. Um, it's just one area at a time. Um, there's no question in our mind that there's more than enough areas to support every mooring in the harbor. It's just a matter of establishing one dock at a time. So maybe that wasn't explained properly in the beginning, um, but there's more than enough. There's not going to be a mooring that doesn't have the opportunity for a permit. So I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, and other good comments here too that I'm just going to bring bring back to to uh, Becca's attention to see if there is in some way I understand the point about two people on a vessel and one of them going and the other one not having any ability to to get anywhere so those need to be looked at um, as well as whether the uh, application can't be mailed in maybe not the first time but maybe the second time so you don't have to deal with that so there's a lot of good points I'm I'm glad. Um, these were brought up, and and uh, we'll we'll address them and and see what can be resolved. All right, thank you. Um, we're going to bring it back to the advisory board. Any uh, questions from the from Jeremiah? Not a question, but um, I just want to thank everyone for being here and providing that feedback. I think we shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of good. So I think a lot of people have identified that there is an issue with um, the skiffs and kayaks and people not necessarily taking care of their vessels and how that impacts others who are taking their care of their vessels and the environment. So I think this is a great step. Um, but also there are going to be kinks. And so I think this is so crucial what's happening right now of sharing the feedback and the city being open to hearing that and making changes. Um, I would just also add that as we are making changes, I think that in order to build trust with this community, we should kind of take each enforcement case by case um, as we're learning. And, you know, if people have violated the rules um, and those rules are in question or they might not understand them, I think in the beginning, you know, we need to step into this lightly as we're learning. Um, in terms of the enforcement and the additional charges, I think that we really need to operate from zero-based budgeting with this harbor. And we are not, um, pay, we don't have the money right now to pay for all the maintenance that this harbor needs in terms of the dock. And I think with these opportunities, like enforcement costs money and time, um, and from what I've seen of the harbor's budget, they operate very leanly, um, but things like enforcement and maintenance do cost money. Um, and in the comparisons I've done of moorings and um, liveaboard permits and things like that compared to other cities, um, I do think that there's opportunity for us to kind of look at those expenses um, and making sure that we are meeting our expenses um, in a responsible way that allows us to upkeep um, our services and provide safe um, things for our occupants. So great. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and thank you to Ted for being open to hearing this feedback. I, I, I want to say thank you as well. It, when you have a harbor issue, it seems to make sense to go to the Harbor Advisory Board to bring, to bring up your concerns. Um, I guess my question is for Har Harbor Department, um, this, pro this program, to what extent is the Harbor Advisory Board involved? Um, I know that we used to be a commission decades ago and had um, oversight authority. Um, to my knowledge, we haven't participated in a, in a major way in this program, but are there opportunities for us to be involved or is this a Harbor Department and Council item? Thank you for the question. Um, it's my understanding this program, and I don't know how long you've been on the committee, but the program was developed a couple of years ago. It's been a while since it, so it was before my time. I don't know how it came. I don't know if it came before the Harbor Advisory Board. I don't know if it was an ad hoc, um, but I know it was developed. Uh, in fact, a fee had been in place for some time also, but just had not been implemented based on staff's ability to 
take this project on. So sorry, I don't have a complete answer for you. All right, thank you, uh, Member Green. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. <laughs> In, in taking notes through the, uh, pr thank you all for the presentations, by the way, uh, and taking notes. Uh, one of the, the big items I noticed seems to be policy. Is is there, Ted, because I, I, I'm not familiar with with uh, liver boards <clears throat> and, and, the, uh, and the contracts or leases, but is there is set policy, hopefully, because it sounded to me like there was various issues and different solutions, such as uh, some people have two skiffs, some people have one, some people have none. Uh, is there set policies on all of these questions that the people had? Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I'm, not, I'm gonna answer in that it's not a policy decision, it's a rules and reg situation where the harbor has the authority to make rules and regulations um, so we have the ability to change them also and edit as opposed to policy if policy is in place we're basically going to council to determine what we can or cannot do so this is within the harbor's authority to act on it um, but just like with all these comments i do see some areas where changes can be made and we have that ability to do that so, yeah, it, also, uh, I'm going to kind of address this to Denise and Drew because I know them, not just because I know them better than uh, the others, but where there was a, a group, an association, um, maybe it would be a good idea to, to start, re-jump re that association collect a list of the problems, bring them to the to the Harbor Department and hopefully some policy, some strict policy can be developed because it's it just seems to me looking from the outside that rules aren't hard and fast. I just want to take a moment here before we get beyond this from a Browns Act perspective. This is not an agendized item. Yeah. So we, you know, we took some comment. We, we, we've taken some notes. I suggest if you want to go further with this, you get it on the agenda for the next meeting and allow for full Absolutely. discussion and recommendations by the board. Yeah, so I, I think we definitely have a future agenda item here. With that, I'll just do one more round if there's any high-level comments. Chris, you had one? <laughs> um, my high-level comment would be each of you raised a valid point. It sounds to me like this situation needs to be poured through and rewritten a little bit. I mean, the, the very base idea that uh, a couple living on a boat who have two skiffs because they have different jobs can't have two skiffs is ridiculous. And uh, I look forward to some of this being resolved. Uh, and thank you. It's important. Come next time, too. With that, I'll have just one last, and it's very high level. I was actually, the Bayshore Park that was mentioned, I actually helped with the cleanup about two-ish years ago. Uh, and I remember that was some of the beginnings of that, is to clean all that stuff up and start the SCIF implementation. But there was no Harbor Advisory Board input to that that I'm aware of. That, any other, Sharice, nothing? I was just going to add that when this first started, um, talking about... Um, Enforcing uh, the SCIF, um, we did mention prioritizing um, liveaboards and moorings. And we didn't is there any kind of thing in place when you put somebody on the wait wait list that they have priority if they actually are on a mooring or a liveaboard? Yeah. I, Does that I is there a hierarchy right now as far as that wait list, or do you just start off at the bottom no matter who you are? Well, I, again, I would just answer that every mooring. We'll have a permit. Okay. All right. So I just wanted to mention that is something that we are. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I understand. There's some passion. <laughs> Again, let's. So we'll we'll look at it and yeah. we'll probably do a future. Yeah. Well, let's uh, go ahead and we'll do a future agenda item and um and that is something that we were talking about before. Gene, don't make me regret this. Go ahead. 
Can we postpone them signing this thing until we had a, an agenda item and looked at it? That's up to Ted, but yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if that's appropriate to make this decision in this format, yeah, um, I, I, but I would I yeah. probably will work with the Harbor Department or Harbor Director after this, but it's not a HAB topic at this point. I think the ball has to go to the Harbor Department. Yeah, it's a it's a rules thing. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, close public comment. Um, again, uh, we do appreciate everybody's input. We do listen, and hopefully we can uh, make it better. And again, I appreciate the passion that all you guys have shared with us. Uh, all right, with that, we'll go ahead and move on to the consent agenda. Uh, we have the approval of the minutes and the Harbor Department status report. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to have uh, the motion to approve the consent agenda. I so move. All right, anybody second that? All right, the second. Uh, Jeremiah. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Nope. Passes 7 0. Put that. Excuse me. Uh, we'll move to business item uh, B1, which is the Harbor Director Department update. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay. So, what I'll start off with again is offshore wind. Every meeting, I'd like to give you a little bit of an update. We've been talking about some of the funding that's been available to the city. The main one that is in play right now is with um, San Luis Obispo County. It's the million dollar grant. Um, we have received um, a partial MOU at this point, basically indicating that we will be funded and that our request for an environmental study um, will be uh, a major part of the study in Morro Bay. Um, the piece that we're missing is they don't have a total cost of the entire study at this point, but we do know that they don't anticipate the, the entire million dollar will be used for the study. Any funds remaining will be distributed to Morro Bay, Port St. Louis, and Cal Poly. We don't know those percentages and we don't know the dollar amounts, um, but we expect in the next couple of weeks. Um, they anticipate having this in place by the end of June. I don't know if that'll happen, um, but they do anticipate the studies starting this summer. So we'll be looking forward to that. And I think it's going to be important because it's going to inform not only the city, but our stakeholders in regards to the environmental issues that are going to potentially come this way. Another th um, grant uh, opportunity that literally came up this past week or two, um, um, our mayor pro tem um, Landrum found it and submitted it to us. Um, we were able to quickly move on this. It literally is due Monday night at midnight. Um, we anticipate we will have an application in. Um, there's an opportunity for a hundred thousand dollar grant, which our intention would be to use strictly for stakeholder engagement so that we can have enough series of um, informative meetings with the public, get input, and use that uh, towards any future actions. Regarding the Harbor Dredge, um, it is scheduled. Uh, the Aquina will be here May 9th. Uh, we anticipate that being a three-week dredge, which means it could take us past Memorial Day weekend. Um, but my experience with them last year, and this is not my experience with with dredging, um, it has very little impact on harbor operations. So they're pretty much out of the way and um, not not interfering with anything. The full dredge is still intended to occur, and I call it the full dredge where the inlet and the back bay will be dredged in 2025. What the Army Corps anticipates doing is dredging the inlet this time next year, and then in the fall coming back um, with the dredge that would be um, all the way back past the boat ramp. So we'll have more information on that as that gets developed. I believe they're still in the permitting process for that. Um, as you saw in the agenda and a, a um, income report, <laughs> um, you may have some questions on that. I don't know how much we can answer. I'd just like to indicate to you that that's not a full income report. That's what we have available to us throughout the year. 
It's not inclusive of other funds that go into the harbor account. It's not inclusive of potential encumbrances. There's a lot there that doesn't tell the entire picture. The best it can be used for is a single line item. Are we um, over or under budget? And that's about its only use for us at this point in time. I will tell you just from my experience from this year and last year, I do anticipate um, that we will um, be within our budget, both income and expenses for the final um, this year. I'll tell you some items um, in regards to the harbor budget. Um, we are budgeting again uh, $40,000 every year as a reserve for vehicle and vessel replacement. That's something that had not been done in the past. And when a vessel and vehicle goes down, if you don't have funding, you have to operate without it. So we're building a, an account where we can draw on it um, when the next vessel needs to be replaced or when the next vehicle needs to be replaced. We also are budgeting $300,000 into completing the commercial fishing dock repairs. And um, if you've seen what's been going on with those, there's been a little bit of a slowdown in that it became difficult for a, almost a 60 day period to obtain the proper uh, materials. So all the materials are in. Um, we expect that project to start up again in the next week or two. And I would also like to report that we have been notified that due to the storm damage of our docks, um, we are gonna be receiving about $130,000 in insurance reimbursement. So that'll also go towards that dock repair project. Um, in this area here, I also noted that um, the, seven, the um, vehicle that was replaced um, this past year, brand new vehicle is currently uh, being outfitted and that should be an operation. I also wanna report that uh, the UTV has been ordered for this year. Thank you, friends of the harbor. Um, and we're really looking forward to, to getting that vehicle on site. Getting to harbor activities regarding the infrastructure. We've talked about the DBW grant for the boat ramp replacement that has been placed on hold, if not ended. Um, we are looking into potentially um, doing a concrete repair of the surface. So um, we'll be looking into that um, after the summer and seeing what kind of cost and what kind of um, construction would be required to get that done. And that would be done without a DBW grant. TPAIR funding, as you know, um, the, the harbor had received a million and a half appropriation from Congress approximately two years ago. Those funds are available to us. The studies that we had done indicated that the million and a half was not going to complete even what we had hoped it would complete. We had additional work done below water, indicating approximately $7 million of additional funding will be needed to repair the North T Pier. Um, we made our requests to Congress this past February. We have heard back from Senator Butler and Congressman Carbajal, and both of them are recommending funding for this project this year, which is very encouraging. It doesn't mean we're gonna get it. The first step is they have to request it, and they have only a certain amount of money um, each fiscal year that they can request for appropriations, and we're gonna be a part of that. So we're really looking forward to seeing that completed. Harbor Drive Isle, um, traffic engineer has been working on that. Um, I have received some initial um, layouts of that. I met with them recently to go over the recommendation that had come out of the HAB committee, and that was could we do a some sort of an um, interim harbor walk along that side of the Embarcadero. Um, we discussed it. We walked it with them. And we're going to be able to do something, not not to the degree that we had hoped for. Part of the issue is you cannot mark an area as a walkway unless it meets all ADA requirements. So we can't, we can't do that with this particular project, but what we can do is mark the drive aisle, which in and of itself identifies areas outside the drive aisle where you can walk. It's just that those areas outside the drive aisle cannot be marked as 
pedestrian walkway, um, anything like that. Uh, but I think it's going to be clear enough to individuals walking in that area that when a car is approaching them, that's the drive aisle, you know, let me move over to a safe area. So um, I don't know the timing on that. That will be a public works project. They have some other striping they plan to do, so it's going to be tied into that. I, th I think he did mention to me it could happen later this summer, so we'll we'll see about that. Um, and as a part of that, um, we're going to be giving back a couple of parking spaces um, to that area that have been used by Harbor Patrol. We have another area that we'll be able to do to use to park our vehicles. Let's see, what else here? Um, Harbor revetment assessment. This is a public works project. Again, Brady and Associates has been awarded that contract. Um, that will be starting soon. Um, that will be a complete assessment of all of revetment and seawalls within the harbor. That was funded years ago, so it's not taking anything out of our existing budget. It's been appropriated, I think, maybe four years ago. Um, that will inform us, uh, again, additionally, when the city goes back to uh, D.C. for more funding as an opportunity. Typically, when, you, when you're asking for money, you need to give a pretty good reason why you need it. And that's the reason for having a study like that. Let's see, leaseholder relationships. Um, we are moving forward with Yardi. Yardi is a, a property management software. Um, we are working on the contract with them right now. We've done three or four uh, Zoom meetings with them in regards to how this will um, enhance our ability to manage contracts, but it'll basically include a digital version of everything we have in our file. It'll inform us uh, if an insurance policy is lapsing. It'll inform us as to the status of, let's say, a development. It'll remind us um, regarding upcoming issues that we may need to deal with. Um, so it's going to be really helpful, and we're hoping to start that uh, sometime in June. We have selected a new appraiser. As you are aware, um, our appraisal company um, retired. Um, we have a, an MAI, MAI appraiser, Central California Appraisals, Michael Berger, a very large company. Um, they will be performing appraisals for us as we go forward. And some of the real estate that uh, we've been working on, I have mentioned this in the past, Bayfront Marina is still in process. Um, that has to do with basically similar situation where the tidelands kind of splits some buildings on their property. Mora Bay Oyster uh, in regards to um, their lease with the harbor and some requirements for improvements. Um, as you may have seen at council, Giovanni's uh, lease, which was another situation where tidelands came across a very small section of their property. Um, that has been completed. Three stacks has been resolved. Um, and you, as you know, Moore Bay Fish Company is now complete and operating. Uh, the Dutchman, thanks to Lori, um, is now complete and their project is moving forward, which has to do with, with some of their um, piers and pilings and wharf in the background, in the back. TLC Enterprises, if you haven't seen that property, you need to go take a look at it. It is really a jewel in the harbor and we're, we're very grateful that that is complete. And as you've seen, Libertine is closed. Um, and they will be for some time until Coastal Commission is able to act on demolition permit. And APC um, is moving forward with their plan project. That will be going to a June Planning Commission meeting. I don't know the date on that, but that'll be the first review of the Planning Commission for that project. June 4th. There you go. Uh, Iron Man will be May 19th. That is a Sunday, that's a change from previous years. Um, the best news with Ironman is that a final agreement has been reached with State Park so that the run portion will now go through State Park. That will eliminate the three laps on the Embarcadero, which means the Embarcadero is gonna be able to open up a heck of a lot sooner than it did last year, and it'll be a lot less impact on the Embarcadero. So we're gonna see how that plays out. Also, uh, finally, um, 
there was a uh, ad hoc committee, joint ad hoc committee to have in CFAC committee. That's been going on for a long, long time. It's been through quite a bit of a process. Um, city has received their recommendations. Um, I have met with the Embarcadero master leaseholders to get a response from them. Um, I do have a staff recommendation. I'd love to be able to present it to you, but I have to present it to council first, um, which will be the 14th of May. So if you have an opportunity, at least look for that um, notice and you can, you'll see that document. And then we can discuss it at a future meeting if you'd like to. And that is all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Harvard Director Schiavone. Uh, I'll start on my right for any questions. I um, just had one. Well, I have a few questions, but the first um, with your budget, you said that um, revenue would meet expenses. And I just want to understand what the right takeaway is, because my understanding is we have quite a bit of unfunded maintenance. So um should our takeaway be that the operating budget is fine, but that there's millions in unfunded maintenance with the harbor still? Thank you for the question. That's exactly right. We 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 can maintain current situations, current maintenance. We're we're getting a little bit on some of the past maintenance, as an example, the commercial fishing docks. We've just redirected money that that has been in the reserve account. That's all we've done. We, we are not setting enough aside to handle the major maintenance that needs to be handled in the harbor. Okay. Um, and then I had another question. I've seen that recently several additional um, hotels have been approved or in planning for the city. Um, and I understand that when tourists visit our city, the harbor doesn't get any of the TOT tax from those, although you bear the expense for variable expenses like trash um, and lifeguard calls for help, things like that. Are there any plans in work with the city to understand how when we have additional tourists entering the city, um, the Harbor Fund can be compensated for the cost they bear for those? So good good question again, and that's, that, that's truly a policy decision that the city makes. Um, the Harbor doesn't receive TOT tax, as you as you mentioned, the harbor does receive Measure E funds. Measure E is funded through sales tax, and we do get a portion. Um, in fact, the lifeguard program is primarily funded by that. Um, we did purchase the truck last year as a result of that. So they do take in consideration enforcement, harbor enforcement, um, safety, and those issues. Um, it's It's helpful. We could still use a lot more. Thanks. And just one more question. Um, with the deeper dredge that's planned, are, are the permits that the Army Corps of Engineers is working towards, do those work within an assumption that there will still be um, trout present and they're working on that expectation? Or is that something that could derail those plans with the permits that they're getting? If I understand the question, well, first, let me just reply to the deeper dredge the the army corps has a, has a approved dredge depth and they have oh, sorry, deeper into the oh deeper into the harbor okay um so th that's part of the reason the permit is still pending is the trout issue um they've they've made that application they will have to mitigate that it's my understanding and i'm, I'm not how sure this is 100 percent accurate but i was told they will be tagging them and releasing them so how that's done, I have no idea. Um, but I did see even in the current dredge um, that's going to start in a few weeks, there were some requirements that the shovel is not turned on until it hits bottom. So in other words, not to be sucking any additional water that might be surrounding. So I know they're taking some measures, in that, and that was specifically mentioned because of the trout. Um, so I know they're aware of it. They take all measures that they have to. And next year, they hopefully will have a permit to, to go all the way back. Remember, Green? Uh, sure, I, have, I have some questions. Uh, first, uh, starting with um, uh, public rights of way. Um, I know that uh, you know a number, a number of businesses have uh, tables and chairs uh, out. Um, regarding uh, public rights of way, um, do is there? Uh, I know you're speaking with Yar, uh, Yardy, the the property management software. 
Um, do, have you guys talked about a, a uh, some sort of public mechanism for uh, for code enforcement or some sort of publicly accessible function that helps their ability to manage property? If I look confused, I'm just a... So, let, 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 me, let me follow up then. Okay. Um, uh, given that we're sort of uh, overseeing Tideland's properties and public rights of way are a big part of that and uh, knowing that the Planning Commission has done a, a wonderful job of late uh, on the front end of uh, project approvals and, and that kind of thing, keeping open spaces and physical access ways. Now, to match, to have practice match theory requires an enforcement mechanism. And oftentimes the public is the easiest way, you know, the easiest, cheapest way uh, to to drive enforcement when we don't have capacity to, to enforce things like um, private vehicles, taking public uh, parking spaces, coned off public parking spaces, uh, hotel signage that says private parking when it's not private parking um, and tables and chairs uh, that have not been uh, previously approved on public rights of way. Uh, uh, that's a really good observation. I will tell you this, Public Works does have a program. Now this is a little bit different, but it does exactly what you're talking about. If you see a pothole, you can go onto the city website and indicate as a resident or visitor, hey, there's a pothole here. You can click it on a map. Um, that's a great point. I'd love to be able to present that to planning, um, community development, and, and see if there isn't some way to, or maybe that needs to be an entire city um, application. Yeah, that, that public work software is really good, and, and I think the public is, is appreciative of being able to see what intersections or where 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 places have been marked. Um, speaking of which, I, I, um, if there is any potential liability about uh, the painted walkway through Giovanni's not being ADA, Perhaps we want to paint over that walkway black so that it doesn't see. Uh, uh, I know that that, that has previously been uh, designated as a walkway, a public access walkway, and it seems very similar to the situation through the drive aisle. Um, just, just, just food for thought that that if it's marked as pedestrian access way and should be pedestrian access way, I'm not sure about the ADA component whether. We're on the hook for something. If that makes sense. It's not signed that way. There's a stripe. Okay, so if you stripe it but don't sign it, then it's a kind of vague. And then you take the it. middle where the cars and trucks actually go, and you say that's the roadway. All right, but I just, yeah. just look at work this. around. Okay, yeah. work around. I, okay. I'd like to make a point regarding um, that area back there. So, as a part of their lease agreement, and this is already in the lease, you can read it yourself. It's public information. They will be required to um, repair that entire wharf, and they will be required to make those repairs to that area too. Um, regarding the uh, the the financial statement of sorts, uh, and a couple of questions, quick policy questions. Um, uh, are 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 master leases only require? Is it true that they only require annual reporting and annual collection of percent rent, or is there a month interim reporting? It's annual. Okay, so uh, annual uh, reporting. Of, of percent rent and annual collection, and both of those happen at the same time. Correct. Um, is there anything in master leases uh, that uh, that allows our harbor department to to? Um, let me take that back. Um, I don't want to phrase this. Is there anything that prevents uh, master leaseholders uh, from requiring monthly reporting and collection from tenants? No, some of them do. Okay. So uh, as, as our leases are currently written, uh, master leaseholders can re require monthly reporting and monthly collection, and then only report to us annually uh, and collect annually. Correct, that, except we don't tell them that what they can or cannot do regarding those subleases. It's up to them if they want to collect it or not. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there anything in leases that uh, prevents our, the city from communicating with tenants? From a... Like, can we check on their wellness? I of a guess? tenant? Yeah, yeah. Or is all communication through the master leaseholder? I mean, our communication is through the master leaseholder. Okay. That's that's our agreement. So we don't have authority over the tenants as we do the master leaseholder. Sure, sure. Yeah. okay. Um, cool. And then the last question regarding the $1 million uh, potential allocation uh, for, uh, for offshore wind. Um, is your sense that of that million dollars, assuming that it's going to get allocated some in some combination of Morro Bay, 
Port St. Louis and Cal Poly Pier, that the allocation is in some way indicative of the intentions of the the county or the state or the federal government, or is that pure purely environmental review? Uh, is your without, question? You, I'm sorry. I, I guess I'm, uh, regarding the allocation of that million dollars, are we hopeful that we get most of that, oh. or is that indicate in, indicative of uh, more burdensome infrastructure coming to Morro Bay? Um, w well, we're asking for as much as we can get based on the requirements we've submitted, which is pretty heavy on the um, environmental side, less on the in infrastructure side. We do believe that Cal Poly and Port St. Louis pretty much the same. And so we should be entitled to 50% and them 50%, but that's not our decision. And we don't know the number yet. Thank you, Ted. All right, thank you, Member Green. Gene or Jeremiah, any questions about the budget? Go ahead, Gene. Yeah, yeah Chad, really quick. Um, on your, um, your appraisal that you guys hired, do they have marine knowledge? They have waterfront knowledge. So they're appraisers. They're, they're, um, MA, MAI has very strict standards in terms of um, how they appraise and what they appraise. Uh, but, but they're very heavy in commercial applications. So they know businesses. Um, they understand retail, restaurant. But again, <clears throat> they're not appraising the business or the operation, they're appraising the property and its location and its potential. Okay, we have a different different dog down here, so, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. If I can keep from sneezing. Okay, I had questions. So I, I like the fact that you have a line item for maintenance and replacement fund for vehicles, that's, good. Um, uh, a while ago, a few years ago, we worked really hard to create a reserve fund um, for situations like that and for other emergencies, as well as having enough initial funds that we could actually receive grants. I'm just wondering, we got like the line item for the um, budget, but do we know what is in the coffers right now of that reserve fund because I think it's been two years since I've seen what our balance was for reserve. And that's a separate reserve from, let's say, the the one we're setting aside separately for auto. That's an internal reserve that we're doing. If you're referring to the reserve reserve fund, the last I checked with finance, it was in the eight hundred thousand dollar range. That's good, thank you. Um, and then uh, you said that you negotiated the lease with Daguerre-Moore and I, I think that you guys have been talking about it, but so the Harbor Walk is not going to, I just if some clarity because we've done like maps of how it should go through um, I, while they're working on things when it's all said and done, is there going to be an ADA Harbor Walk going through there? That will be addressed with planning and coastal at the time. They'll have a requirement to do that repair, and they're probably going to have to meet all the new standards. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, just a couple more questions, Ted. Uh, it's been a while. Any updates from the FEMA? FEMA, and I'm just giving you my personal opinion from everything I've seen and my experience, doesn't look good. Yeah. Okay, so very to... Part of FEMA's requirement is a history of maintenance. Gotcha. All right, fair enough. Uh, last time we met, the new boat was out of commission. Is it back in service yet? It is back in service and the fire system is operating. Okay. Um, one last question. These are line, budget line items. Uh, a couple of things caught my eye. They're not big dollar amounts, but I see the north and south T pier were both fun, estimated to get about 27K in revenue. Um, and it looks like this kind of flip flopped. Uh, I know the north pier is heavily damaged. Is that kind of reflected in these numbers? Because they can't, people can't tie up to it. If you can't answer, I'm totally happy with that. I figure I'm putting you on the spot. I was just curious because I know that 
pier is pretty beat up. Yeah. Would you ask the question one more time? Yeah. So uh, in the, on the first page of the budget, there's north and south T pier dockage. They both have an estimated revenue of 27K. Um, in the budget year to date, you see one is 50,000 in revenue and one's 20, 21,000. So I was wondering, are, are we seeing more usage of the peers or are those peers impaired from a revenue perspective? There's less usage. We just don't have the vessels using the pier. Um, just happenstance, people just not showing up. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. It's not because of damage. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, and then I do see a little pop in the overtime pay. Do we expect that to continue through the rest of the fiscal year? Very likely. Yeah. It's very difficult for Harbor Department to operate um, when we have officers that, you know, have vacation, they have training. Um, you can't oper you, you can't just go without a body. You, you need to have two people on duty at all times. Yeah. So oftentimes there's overtime. And that's being looked at for this next year. Hopefully there will be some yeah. ways around that. Yeah, I mean, you, you need to budget for it, obviously, for, for reasons. It just seems like you're running over and yeah. didn't budget enough from, from last year. Okay. Fair enough. I think that's it for questions. Uh, I will open it up to public comment. Uh, anybody in the audience have co public comment about item business item B1? Bill LaFay, uh, resident of Morro Bay, thank you. Just a couple things that um, cropped up. Uh, legal services looks like it uh, increased. You budgeted for 50000 and I believe it's at um, sixty-seven right now, if I'm not mistaken. So the one thing is that uh, at the last city council meeting, what the city attorney was trying to do is that if he was in litigation with any of the leaseholders or any type of projects, he was going to try to charge his time actually to the applicant as opposed to the Harbor Department. Is that something that's going to um, go, be going forward um, in the future? So that was one of my other, my one question um, for right now. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments from the audience? Um, the business item B1? Nope. AGP, is there any hand raised in the queue? Thank you, Chair Myers. There are currently no raised hands in the queue. All right. Thank you. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Or Do you want to address the legal thing? Do you want to ask me the question? Uh, Again, the, you don't necessarily address. Yeah, I got you. Got you. Sorry. Um, the question was, is uh, uh, the line item for legal is you were over budget. Um, there was some, it was presumably it's from the from the lease negotiation process. Um, and is there any way to capture that, right. push it into the leaseholder? So, so from a budgeting standpoint, um, there's several items where the harbor doesn't budget. City budgets those, and then we're appropriated a certain percentage. And that's one of the items is legal expense. So we may not always have a budgeted amount that matches um, what we end up doing. Legal expense really difficult to um, estimate because you never know what you're going to run into. Um, I will tell you, though, that we have gone over and we probably will go over again this next year just simply because uh, we've been working on a dozen or more leases that were more or less pending situations that we had to deal with. And we took them on pretty quickly and hard and heavy to get them through the process. And that takes a lot of legal expense. So. Uh, the gist wasn't so much that we were over budget. I'm just saying that if we had any luck recouping that cost by pushing it on to the leaseholder. So it's it's uh, unless it's in their lease, it's very difficult. We have fees that we can charge for certain situations, um, but if we're negotiating on a lease and and that information isn't in the lease, okay. uh, you can't do it. It will be something that will be considered on future leases. Right now, the planning, uh, the the community development department does that with developers, and I think it's a great idea. If a developer wants to come into town, they're going to take a lot of staff time. They're going to take a lot of legal time. They charge them for all of that time. Um, and so that's a... We have a 40-year window to roll that out then. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I think I'll close uh, business item B2. 
B1. <clears throat> uh, with that, we will go. I just lost my. Oh, here it is. The item B2, a oh, vessel fee ad hoc committee update. I will go to uh, Member Witowski. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, I was not here, I think, at the last meeting where we discussed this, but this is something. Um, we have been looking into vessel fees and how our fees compare to other um, neighboring harbors um, and have some early insights um, such as our fees appear to scale, um, not scale up with as you go up in length for whereas most other harbors there is as your um, length of your vessel increases, so do proportionally the price per foot per mooring. Um, a few other learnings like that that we're planning to bring to the next meeting. However, since I wasn't here to kind of hear the charter last time, I'd love to just check in with you, Ted, on what exactly the needs you have are in this area and what kind of information we could bring you um, insights and recommendations in the port uh, report that would be most useful? I think um, we're looking to make certain that, I mean, we know that our harbor doesn't have the highest amenities, right? Um, but we also know we're on the very low end of that scale of pricing. And as you pointed out earlier, um, harbor funds are not sufficient to cover harbor maintenance. Um, so we, we need to be, whether, you know, we're in the middle or the lower part of the middle, we, we need to be closer to some, um, you know, some market rate. Um, and I agree with you. We, we definitely want to look at the recreational fee piece of this um, from a transient standpoint, because that's what we do. Um, we also want you to look into any commercial application fees. We have recently, if you didn't see it in the um, recommendation to council for our fees, which was approved, we did put a fee in for um, cruise vessel. Not that we can take a cruise vessel into our harbor, but they can uh, moor offshore. They can bring passengers here. Um, and we put it in place because we have had contact regarding that. And we don't want to miss that opportunity. But that is something we'd love for you to look into because all we did at that point was pick the middle between the highest and lowest that we saw. Um, but we also need to have the opportunity to charge commercial vessels that may or may not come into our harbor. And, and we have no idea on what all the different, not just what they charge, let's say on a daily rate, but what are the services, few, uh, electric, water, um, support from staff, um, we, you know, we don't even know. So whatever you can gather from that, I think is going to be helpful to us. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. All right. Um, Chris, any other comments? Not a comment. Uh, make? Uh, yeah. Thank you for that clarification. You know, we you know, kind of pulled some rates, but just wanted to make sure that we're on track and don't go down a rabbit hole that you know, we don't need to. So um, hopefully we'll have a, a update uh, in June. Mm -hmm. And uh, a little more detail on the agenda and bring it to discussion. Gene? Yes. Yeah, just a comment. I mentioned this once before. Several years ago, when the line dredge pump um, dredge uh, system was in there, the company left their pipes, not their vessels, but their pipes, anchored up in the harbor for six months. And so I think that we need to make sure that we're not talking more about just vessels, but equipment. Thank you. That's good insight. Um, any other comments, questions? Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and open up item business item B2 to comments from the audience. Any comments on, on that particular topic? Nope. AGP, anybody on the phone with their hand out? Thank you, Chair Myers. There are currently no raised hands in the queue. All right. Well, that gives it closes item. Business item B2. Next one is B3, the mooring field ad hoc. Um, this one been quite interesting. Uh, I'll start with a brief introduction and I'll probably have Gene and, and uh, Chris speak to it because they're a lot more knowledgeable. Um, but yeah, there's there was uh, brought to the attention of the Harbor Department a uh, number of mooring field incidents where the boats 
a lot of words used, bumped into each other, lack of a better word. Um, so uh, ad hoc was formed to, to, to try to look at, you know, what sort of short-term, long-term solutions, uh, where are we at today? Uh, we met with the Harbor Department. They've been looking at it for quite some time. Um, so it was uh, pretty interesting. I learned a lot about mooring fields. Um, we had one uh, session at the Yacht Club where we all got together along with the Harbor Master uh, Becca Kelly and talked through, you know, what, what do we know and what do we don't know? And so that I'm going to let Member Vale talk first. <clears throat> well, I, I, part of this is uh, there are allegations that um, the scope on the moorings, the chain sc scope on the moorings may not be optimal. That, in fact, an allegation or two that moorings actually move, uh, and which is possible. And then again, there's some that are the blocks are six feet under the sand, so probably not as possible. Uh, allegations of a dozen or so collisions or elisions over time during the storm season, basically, where boats have uh, tapped each other. Um, one allegation of serious damage, most of it is minimal. Um, and so the, this discussion, for instance, there were four incidents at the Yacht Club itself. They have 25 moorings. Um, it looks like the Yacht Club is solving its own problems at this stage. Uh, and so we're, we're just on the, on the fringe of that, including the option of bringing in a qualified surveyor to survey the, the exact pinpoint GPS, et cetera, position of each mooring um, and to scope out the bay, the actual underbody of the bay, how much of it is silt, how much of it is good sand, how much of it is some form of hard pan. And, uh, but we've only had one serious meeting, uh, but we're working on it. Thank you, Member Bill. Member Dowdy, I'm sure you have a few comments. Yes. Um, I've been in this business a long time. So um, I have to be concerned about conflict of interest. So I can give you guys general information, but I will not be making any recommendation. Um, as you all know, um, oh. there are about 150 moorings in the bay, uh, 25 for Moore Bay Marina and maybe 25 for the Yacht Club, plus or minus. Um, there are the rest of them are more or less privately owned. Uh, the, the city owns, I think, seven, maybe eight. Um, and everybody is on a three to one scope. Um, if you have an anchor, you're talking about a seven to one scope. Um, most of the moorings are ranging about 15 to 25 feet of water. Some of them are as deep as 35 feet. Some of them are as shallow as 11, 12 feet. Um, what we're proposing to do at this point um, is that every time we inspect a mooring, we will center over the top of the block. And where the block is at is not necessarily apparent where the, the boat is going around and around. It may be 50 feet away where the bottom chain of lane go to one side and the boat is pivoting around there. So our proposal is that when we center over the top of a block, we will GPS it. And then we will plus or minus whatever um, the tolerance of the GPS is. And then if it's say 15 feet, well then we'll draw a circle of say 45 feet. And then if the boat is a 40 foot boat, we'll then reach that radius out to that. And then eventually we will have uh, a chart. We'll hopefully use a chart instead of just a GP, uh, Google map. Well, we'll have a chart with all these little circles around the whole bay. And we can see where there's been some issues and where there ha have been some issues. Um, every boat is different. Some boats trail all the way back. Some boats were horse all the way back and forth. I've seen boats where they're spreader sailboats are touching the water from one way to the other way. Um, some boats climb up into the current and into the wind. So you can't assume that all boats are going to be acting the same. Um, in, the, in the past, we've more or less, um, so have there have been some years when there have been no instances. Um, this last year, there was quite a few. Um, I don't know quite what the solution is, except to, to we try to put a boring block um, away from everybody else. If there is an is incident between one boat and another, and the boat who feels like they're getting banged on wants me to go and move their mooring, we can do that. 
but we just can't arbitrarily go move another mooring because now all of a sudden there may be an issue over that side. So basically, we when we locate a mooring, we take bearings and we take a GPS on them. And like we say, every mooring needs to be inspected every two years. Some of the chain will wear down from one inch down to a quarter of an inch. Um, some boats just don't have any chain wear at all. I know that they're looking at new ways of doing moorings. It's called the C-Flex mooring, which is basically either a block of concrete on the bottom with an eye or a screw, a helical screw that screws into the, the, the shore, the mud down below with like rubber bands that go up to the mooring bowl. Um, I know that the AP put in about 50 of them in a Mosa Beach several years ago, and then they took them all back out because they didn't seem to work. Um, our bay is a very linear bay, and you know, because it's going north and south mostly. And as long as the wind's coming from the north or northwest, everything seems to handle lay it okay. Or they're all coming out of the south with a outgoing tide. But when you get the tide going one way, wind going another, and maybe a, a light hold boat against a heavy boat, there is going to be some collision. And that's what it is right now. So we're trying to straighten that out and through our community and and uh, hopefully we can get this solved soon. Thank you, Member Gene. Um, yeah, my takeaway, I'm not the expert uh, around a lot of smart people. Uh, we, during that meeting, we uh, brainstormed uh, several different approaches. Each one has its um, upside and downside. And so that's really the next goal. Um, it's a, It can be a Pandora's box, you, you know, depending on what you find on each mooring site. Uh, they are privately owned, and so there's implications of that. If you make any declarations about any sort of site, what it can and can't support. So we're trying to step lightly um, and be mindful of the, any sort of consequences. Um, what we don't want to do, uh, there's sort of a history of not doing anything and letting something fester for decades. And we really don't want to take that approach either because that has all sorts of other issues. So we want to address it, but also want to be mindful of the consequences of any of those actions. So um, we're going to get together uh, in the ad hoc, again, with the harbor director, make sure we're going down the right path. There's monetary expenditures, like a survey. Um, there is one gentleman that's on the larger ad hoc that actually does surveying for a living. He's actually going to do a pro bono for a small number of sites. Uh, we're going to take a look at that to see if the results we get for that is what we expect and what we can use before we make any other larger commitments. So um, I know a lot of liveaboards here, I imagine there's some passion and some concerns you have, and we're trying to tread lightly and be mindful of any impacts that this might have. Absolutely, go ahead. This is just coming out of my hat. Liveaboards, mooring owners, any of you have trouble this past winter that's one boat, two boats. Do I see three boats? Okay. All right, thanks. All right, thank you. Um, I guess as a little more, is there more boats that have had issues other than you have had that you've seen that are not represented here? Okay, okay, yeah, I just, that's all I needed. <laughs> all right, yeah. Um, any other comments on that one, questions? Um, well, maybe we're good. Uh, B, item B3 is open for public comment if anybody in the audience would like to have a comment. Hi, my name is Devin Hatcher. I live here in Morro Bay, work as a merchant mariner and a scuba diver. Um, and I've looked in the moorings quite a bit, uh, just kind of seeing what this community might need uh, with uh, Jim Sanders business being up for sale. And uh, I'd like to get that up and running or, you know, present it to uh, the right person who could do that. Um, I've spoke to Avila uh, Harbor Department about that and Chris Munger down in Avila um, just to see if they had any suggestions as far as an apprenticeship program was concerned. Um, so I wanted to bring to you that uh, they said that their staff is pretty full and they don't really have an opening to train somebody. But if there was an incentive uh, for them that they would be open to hearing about it. I asked them if they had perhaps extra staff or uh, equipment that they could use here in Morro Bay, and they said no. 
Um, so just presenting some of my kind of insights uh, into that topic. And then one thing I had a question about uh, in this regard was, uh, are there going to be new laws based on the equipment that's used to inspect the moorings, right? Do we need to have uh, perhaps greener engines uh, that operate the hydraulic cranes um, or uh, perhaps tugs and barges that are perhaps greener or those specs uh, looking at any sort of change in the near future? Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Any other comments uh, in the audience here? No. All right. AGP, uh, anybody with their hands up uh, on the phone? Thank you, Chair Myers. There are currently no raised hands in the queue. All right. With that, uh, any other, bring it back to the board, any other comments, concerns, questions? All right. Um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and close out item B3. Um, with that, uh, we will move on to declaration of future agenda items. I know I have one or two, but I'll let anybody else go first. Um, just to restate the SCIF program to make sure that's in the future. All right. Um, to get that added, any comments? I, I think it was... Um, I would like it to be a future agenda item based on current policy and that the Harbor Advisory Board review it and make some recommendations. Okay. I think we just need a, a majority. Every, any, I think we're all pretty much in favor. Eyes. Eyes. Okay. So future agenda item is this, to have review of the uh, SCIF program for our next session. Yeah, yeah. yeah Paul, rules and regulations. <clears throat> Right. So I I don't think we should limit it to skip. It should be a little broader than skip policy, perhaps. Okay, I'll work with you when we get that to the harbor piece, but beyond just skiffs. Well, just uh there were, that was one of the issues mentioned and there was other things uh the dock or well, the maintenance maintenance uh water issue okay i mean we we should cover as much of what the complaints absolutely seem to be fair yeah. enough yeah okay perhaps the agenda itself could include uh the comments that were being made today like the mm -hmm. minutes of that sort of summarized yeah and perhaps the actual policy itself in the yeah, agenda. I, item. actually um I'm going to ask the harbor director. Um, one of the things I mentioned at the top of the meeting was the association that was in place at some point. I think a couple of the commenters made that. Would that be appropriate to discuss at the next HAB? Was that the Liveaboard group? That the Liveaboard group, was, yes. Was that a? It wasn't a city organization. I mean, that I, to me sounds yeah, like it's kind of like an HOA ish kind of thing. I mean, regular. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I don't think it would fall under the harbor of the city. I mean, that's something they can do on their own. There's no okay. regulations stopping them from reorganizing um, as, you know, a community group, you know, with, with input to the harbor. They can certainly do that. Okay. Right. Absolutely. Go ahead. Um, so I'm part of the Embarcadero Master Leaseholders group, and um, we get together maybe once every two months and we pay for it ourselves. We buy into it and we have somebody who does the minutes for us. Um, but it is really good. Like once we got established and we send things to council and we send letters um, and we go up and we speak on our behalf and it, it's it's more than just one person getting up there. And so it just really does a, a big um big job of expressing your feelings to a up to a bigger audience so if you guys are interested in it i think that you should definitely follow up but it does start with you guys not with the city um controlling it or organizing it so all right thank you Jean. you had a nope okay any other any other future i don't think that's going to make a future agenda item although uh many of us individually would be more than happy to reach out and work with you uh, but it'd be outside of the scope of the HAB um, at this point. Uh, any other future agenda items? No? 
I think that's uh, a wrap for this time. Again, I want to thank everybody that showed up to the audience. I really do appreciate it. Uh, you know, you. want to know your voices are heard. So with that concludes the uh, Harbor Advisory Board for this uh, this month. See y'all in June. I got a question for you. I said, Yeah. Manager for the hotel.